Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Calvary Chapel, Apple Bay. If we're not already in a place to worship, find a seat. Stand up if you can, if you're willing. Why are we here this morning? Is it for the donuts? the blood flowing.
worship Him now. How great, how awesome is He. And together we sing. Everyone sing. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. Holy
Good morning. It's great to see each of you as always. Oh, every once in a while we like to have someone share their salvation story, their, their, their testimony. And today we're blessed to have Elena share hers. So let's welcome Elena up here. being up here that's for sure most times I've done my testimony I've been sitting down and not in front of an audience so bear with me this morning I pray um, yes he is worthy is he not the lamb who was slain for all of us Lord thank you and this morning first of all I'd like to start with prayer oh Lord I pray this morning that as I give my testimony Lord that you would speak through me Lord that you would give me your words for those in need, Lord. You are worthy, Lord. And we love you, Lord. And we praise you for the work that you do, Lord. You are rock solid for each one of us, Lord. And I pray for those who, who don't have you in their lives, that they would come to you, Lord, for that solid rock to stand upon in these days and times, Lord. You give us love. You are our friend. You are our mentor. And I just thank you, Lord, for the work that you have done in my life. 
And I pray all of this, Lord, in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. Okay. I have to get organized here a little bit. Um, I'm going to use a little bit of an imagery here, and that imagery is a tapestry. And um, I think that the Lord is a master weaver of our lives. He weaves threads in and out and takes us from the point at which we are uh, born again of him and um, heals us in the ways that we do not expect or takes us to the places we do not expect that is a friend to us when we're in suffering and um, so this morning, um, I'm talking about the tapestry of life that the Lord lead, that we, the Lord weaves. <laughs> excuse me. For me, the first vertical thread of that tapestry was on a road in Oregon. Um, I was up there with a group of um, my friends on motorcycles, um, my boyfriend at the time, and we were riding through Oregon. Um, we were part of a motorcycle club, and. Um, out in the middle of nowhere, um, we had an absolutely horrendous motorcycle crash. I wasn't affected, um, my boyfriend wasn't affected, and a few of us were not affected, but one of our dear friends um, over sped his bike, hit another bike of our friends, and ricocheted off that bike into oncoming traffic. And our friends were really badly injured. Um, my dear friend was not, was completely obliterated. Um, and my friends, my dear friend Janet, was flat on her face on the ground with five fractures in her pelvis, and my, her husband was, was not doing well. He had fractures in his ribs, and um, it was a mess. <laughs> it was a war zone. I've never experienced anything like that in my life, but I think in some ways, too, the Lord exemplified it to me in a special way. He... Um, In the midst of all of that, a voice came down to me saying, Eleni, you have to stop doing this. And I'm like, okay, Lord, okay, I have to stop doing this. And the first thing that came to my mind was my son, that I had to stop doing it because I had been with a bunch of people in a previous bike accident where somebody had died. And um, I couldn't do it because I realized that there is actually absolutely no protection on a bike whatsoever and um, that I couldn't put him through that. I could not put him through that at all. Um, and all of a sudden, as that, those words came down, there was just a bunch, I'm not gonna say a bunch, there were many people that came up to me and asked me if I needed prayer. Could they pray for me? Could they do something for me? Could they get water for me? Could they do this for me? And I just, it was amazing how many people would just come around and they would just, I, they helped me pick up bags, personal belongings, things of that sort. One lady came up who, who I sat there and I looked at her and I thought, where does that strength come from? She basically came up to my boyfriend and said, um, I'm here, I'm here for service, whatever you need me to do, let me know what I, you need me to do. And he asked her to do something that was just something I would never ask anybody to do. I won't tell you the details of it, but she did it. She got interceded by the police, but she did it. And I can't help but look back at that and say that the Holy Spirit was in her. You don't get that strength just out of the blue. I came back from that situation and um, I was very, very lost. And a lot of my um, co-writers on that trail um, that witnessed this accident pretty much well went along after grieving with life normally, but I was pretty lost. So that's the first vertical thread. Um, the second vertical thread started when I was really young, in fact, sub one. Um, at sub one, I was diagnosed with neurofibrotosis as a young child, which is a degenerative nerve disease, and if it's not taken care of, you can use lose, yeah, you can use, lose the use of your right hand, in my case. Um, for lots of children, it's other things. For my mother, it was white pigmentation on her body. And in the worst case, it's the Elephant Man, if you remember that movie. 
Um, I had my first surgery to remove a fibroma from my hand when I was sub one. And only as of late has the Lord allowed me to see a series of letters that indicated I probably had up to six surgeries by the time I was six. And that was all done here, in, it was done in England. It was done in England at Great Ormond Street Hospital, which is one of the premier hospitals in England for children. Um, I got to know the nurses there, and I had a number of surgeries after that too. One when I was 12 and one just after six. I got to know the nurses there. I was on a first name basis with many of them. Um, I had a file this thick. Um, it was a teaching hospital and a, um, and consequently you were, you would sit in your bed with your bandages and so forth and so on and about 50 doctors would surround you and ask questions and um, it was a very, um, it's a hard thing for kids to be in the hospital. It's a really hard thing for kids to be in a hospital. They don't think they're normal when they're in the hospital. And I happened to be part of the plastic surgery ward with all the kids, all who were the flamidahide babies of the 60s. And they were all in there because their faces were deformed, their hands were deformed, their bodies were deformed, and these people were trying to help them. And a lot of those ch kids I became really good friends with, and a lot of them went through a lot of pain. But the hardest part of this is in the 60s, nobody, your parents couldn't stay with you at night. You had to be by yourself at night. And those times were the worst. Those were the hardest times when it was nighttime. Um, I remember going to church there, and um, interestingly enough, I think this is the first time the Lord came to me, and he, um, I used to sing All Things Bright and Beautiful, which has become one of my favorite hymns. And um, it gave me hope, but I didn't quite know what it was all about at the time. What was interesting about this is it set my life up for um, an interesting series of events. As those, as we say sometimes, you have those little nicks that the enemy gets into. And one of those for me was it set up, and my dad was away a lot. My dad was uh, working in Saudi Arabia or Spain or somewhere like that because that's what his job was, was to go to job sites. And so my mother was in the hospital with me, but my dad wasn't. And I really missed my dad. I felt left by my dad. And so this set up a situation where I was continually looking over my lifetime and seeking love, seeking the love of the father in my husband's and my boyfriend's, which did not lead to good things. And that scene in Oregon that you saw was me living in a life that was um, part of a motorcycle crew, um, a lot of drinking, some drug use, and, um, and the biggest person I was affecting was my son. I was definitely affecting him. So fast forward, I came home, I was lost, very lost. <laughs> and Trevor said, come to church, mom. And I'd noticed he, and he became a believer before I um, became a believer, many of you know Trevor. And um, he had started talking into my life over those few months. Um, I remember coming to church when we were at the old church and everybody welcoming me um, very open heartily and with open arms. But I went to church with Trevor that weekend along with Jocelyn and bless Jocelyn, she sat with me there in the, in the row because I felt like an like a interesting person sitting there. Um, and amazingly, the Holy Spirit, even though I was not saved yet, even though I was coming to the church, the Holy Spirit gave me enough strength to leave my boyfriend at the time, which was pretty amazing since I had gone through a lot with him and had a hard time leaving. And so I gave the whor my heart to the Lord in that November and I was baptized in March. But the biggest thing that happened for me was the Holy Spirit, Lord, and he came and kept tapping me on the shoulder because I was in a relationship where I was sinning. And he kept tapping and kept tapping, and I went to a women's retreat down in Felton and finally got the strength to say to the other person who I was with at that time, I didn't want to do it, and I haven't done it since. So he asked me to stop seeking that love from my boyfriends and instead seek him. And it's been hard. I've had a lot of doors closed by him. Um, and, um, but last Sunday, um, so it's 
Bible college, I've done two testimonies. The first one was about the motorcycle crash. The second one was about my hand, but I hadn't joined them together. And last Sunday, he gave me that thread. And it was really interesting that Pat asked me to do my testimony this weekend, because I'm like, ooh, good. Um, <laughs> so um, he gave me that thread. He gave me that thread that I was always not seeking his love. I was looking for the Father's love elsewhere. And now he's giving me the second horizontal thread, which is him. And praise him for his love and his mercy um, in my life and in my son's life, too, and in Jocelyn's life as well. So God in his, but God in his time and his will has helped me to heal the last seven years of my life. And I have, he has shown me that my father was really just trying to do his job. And, um, but yeah, it's funny how those little chinks the enemy gets in and creates a whole story of its own. It really helped me forgive him and my mom both. And I'm thankful for that. It, he has shown me these letters in a garage that showed me the whole history of my surgeries. He has brought things up to me that, even through television shows, which is hilarious, um, that um, he does a mighty work, especially for those kids and that, that ward. I pray some of them have found him in their lives. So I have two scriptures. Oh, and that in him I can take, I can rest in his peace and love, which I think is the most important thing. So I have two scriptures I'd like to read, um, which speak powerfully, I think, into our lives, because so many of us come from a place of fear in our lives, do we not? This is 1 John 14, 4, 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. And I think most of us are in torment before we find the Lord, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. And then and I'd like to go to Ephesians. Ephesians 3. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, the depth, and the height, to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. As many as you know, I'm going to Bible college, and um, he has blessed me in that experience, and I'm going back to Bible college this Thursday, coming Thursday. And um, he did a wonderful work with me last semester. He, um, I now have met somebody in England, and um, we're engaged. He's my fiance. <laughs> he's, um, he's a man of God, and um, who also is going to Bible college, and is Pastor Brian. Sorry, Pastor Pat, would used to say in a few of his sermons, he's running for the Lord faster than I am. So thank you. Thank you so much. Praise him. <laughs> Let's pray for Elena. Lord, we pray for our sister here. She's just on loan, Lord. We, we love her so much. We pray that you would give her a safe trip back over there. We pray that you would continue to work through your word and through the servants that you've raised up to teach her over there. Lord, to prepare her for whatever you have for her. Thank you for her supernatural hunger for you and for your word and to learn. Thank you for saving her. We pray, Lord, that you would um, just do so much more than what we could ever ask or think through her life, Lord. So we thank you for this account. We thank you that you do all things well. We thank you that you've saved her. And we thank you that you're using her and you will use her. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Uh, I love stories like that. Um, they're true. And no one can argue with their testimonies. So, love hearing them. All right, let's stand together. Need a mic. There we go. Uh, youth, you can be dismissed. 
And let's turn our Bibles to John's Gospel, chapter 12. If you're visiting with us this morning, you can connect with us by texting the word connect to our church number, which is um, in on Google, sometimes on the screen. Uh, but uh, that's, how you can, that's how we can communicate with you and, and let you know what's happening here. A few announcements real quick. Uh, save the date, November 11th is our uh, Operation Christmas Child Packing Party at 1 p.m., so November 11th at 1 p.m., um, and also next Saturday, we're going to join Calvary Chapel San Mateo and have a beach day with them uh, at 10 a.m., it's going to be, at, and we'll send out an email related to this, but um, it's uh, at 10 a.m. at Francis Beach, uh, they're going to have football, volleyball, all kinds of stuff there, um, bring, bring uh, your your drinks, your food, your chairs, all that. Parking's $10 at that beach, but we're, it's really important at times to come together with the rest of the body of Christ and be in unity and uh, see that we're far beyond what we are here in terms of the body of Christ. And so take advantage of that. I'll be there. Um, hopefully some other people from our church will be there because they're expecting us to come in numbers. So um, uh, come on out for that next Saturday at 10, 10 a.m. Francis Beach. Again, we're going to um, send out another email. All right, John's Gospel, chapter 12. Let's begin in verse 9. Now, a great many of the Jews, I'm just reading a few verses back. It's not our main passage, but just for context. Now, a great many of the Jews knew that he was there, and they, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priest plotted to put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him, many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. Verse 12, the next day, a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they heard, uh, then they heard that Jesus was coming uh, to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand the things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. Therefore, the people who were with him when, when he had, uh, called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, bore witness. Verse 18, for this reason, the people also met him because they heard, had, they heard that he had done this sign. And the Pharisees therefore said among themselves, you see that you are uh, accomplishing nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Let's pray together. Father, we are so thankful just having just heard this great story, Lord, of you redeeming your daughter. Um, we just thank you, Lord, that you've saved us, those of us that know you. We rejoice in the fact that our names are written in the book of life. And so we thank you for, for having such a seeking and saving heart, Lord. And we pray now as we look at your word, we pray that you would accomplish your purposes, Lord, that you have sent it to us to accomplish. And we pray that you would, you'd help us yield to you and your Holy Spirit and hear all the things, Lord, not just for information, but to be doers of your word. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Well, we're a little more than halfway uh, through this book of John, and uh, we have officially arrived at the last week of Jesus' public ministry. The following Sunday will be Resurrection Sunday. Uh, as we go through this book, we will, we will see that. But there's so much in between that um, it takes the, the, the second half of John to, to be able to cover it because he's going to be dealing with, you know, this last week, but, but so much of what we're going to see is, is like the night before or the night of his betrayal. So we'll, we'll, we'll look forward to that. But um, these religious leaders are determined, offic determined officially uh, that they're going to put Jesus to death. After Nazareth was raised, John told us in John chapter 11, verse 53, then from that day on, they plotted to put him to death. So this is official. This is what they were going to do. 
and, and they were actually looking for him, trying to find some way to seize him, looking for some opportunity. They had to be careful because of the, his popularity. And so that, that's when people wonder, why, why did they do it at night? You know, uh, It's because they had to have the least amount of people see this. And everyone was watching where he was going, what he was doing. They're aware of him. So they couldn't just do it any old time. Um, but they're no longer trying to discredit him and say that, He's doing what he's doing by the power of Satan. They're no longer using the excuse that he's demon-possessed uh, and he's, he's doing it that way, or they're not questioning who his father is or anything like that. He's completely, they're past that. It's too late. It's not working. And, and he is just uh, gaining popularity so much. And so all those things have failed. Lazarus was dead for four days and he'd been in the tomb for four days. And, and he'd already de- he was already decomposing. And, you know, Mar- Martha said, he stinketh, Lord. I mean, the, I'm sure that the people John remembers, even though it's 60 years later, he remembers that smell. You know, the people that were there that witnessed it, they saw that. They remember the stench. And so now we begin here in verse 12. We're told, because I'm not, I just read the first verses in the beginning for context. But the next day, a great multitude that had come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. And I just want to pause right there because this is what's happening here. This is the, you know, back in Exodus chapter 12, um, God spoke to Moses and Aaron in verses three through six, this. Speak to all the congregation of Israel saying, on the 10th day of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him uh, and, and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons, according to each man's need. You shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You make it. Um, uh, you may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. So it's about to be Passover in a few days. And this day here, we call it Palm Sunday. And I know we're not celebrating Palm Sunday officially because it's not that time of year. But we are celebrating it today because we're coming across it in our account. We're coming across it in, in, in the text that, we're, you know, that we, we've been going through. And so... This is something that, you know, is really important to understand the timing of all of this. And, and we get into that when we cover Palm Sunday more in depth, but we're going to look at it today because it's relevant a little bit. We're going to cover it a little bit. So the, on, on the 10th day of Nisan, which is our, basically our April, um, the, these priests would have to inspect these lambs. So the lambs would be brought the priest would inspect it and, and, and make sure there was no blemish according to what, what God said to Moses and, and Aaron. And they would reject lambs that weren't proper. And they would, there was a whole racket. We've gone over this where they would send them to the, you know, maybe the money changers and, the, and the, um, the people that were buying and selling animals and all that. Or they'd have to go back and, you know, get another one from, the, you know, someone else or their own or whatever because it had to meet certain qualifications. So this Sunday, this particular 10th of Nisan is different than any other before this and has never been since. And that's because the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world would be presented by God himself. God's going to be presenting a lamb publicly to the nation of Israel and to the world but specifically the nation of Israel, um, that, he, that this lamb was the one that was promised. He's the king of Israel. He's the holy, the holy one, the Messiah, and all of that. At one point, Jesus said to the religious leaders, who among you uh, convicts me of sin? I love that he said that. Because there was silence then, and even today, there is silence now. Who can actually convict Jesus of sin today can't happen. It's not possible. So this is this is 
would, would be massive for them. His reputation was everything in terms of how God saw him and how God was presenting him. You know, it's interesting that um, during this time, Jesus was always deflecting. He was always, his time had not yet come. He talked about that. And so he was always telling people, don't tell anybody. Or, you know, my hour's not yet come. They tried to seize him. We've seen it over and over again. They tried so hard to get him. And he would just slip through their fingers. And I, I want to know all the ways that that happened. I would love to see a video of how he went through the midst of them and they couldn't seize him. Were they frozen? You know, you know, did they like stop time or they just couldn't get to him? Like, what was it? I just think, I would love to see how he just went through the midst of them and, and, and all of that. And, and I love the fact that, you know, he, um, he waited until the perfect time to be revealed. Because I know there's this massive crowd. We saw that. This massive crowd that had heard about Jesus uh, raising Lazarus from the dead. And, and think of all the people that had, he had healed and delivered and cleansed and restored and forgiven and fed, taught, been great, gentle with, been gracious with, was moved on compassion over, people he raised from the dead. All those people, they knew that he was going to be coming to Israel, or to Jerusalem rather, for the feast. Many of them had their lives changed forever, just like we've seen today, a testimony of a life changed forever. And they, they just wanted to see him. You know, the population of Jerusalem, Josephus, the Jewish historian at the time, wrote that it was around 150,000, the population at that time in Jerusalem. But during the feast, it would swell to a million or more. Now it was, the Passover, which we're getting close to in our, in our text, it's probably the biggest of the feasts in their minds, especially back then. So it would be huge, huge amount of people. Every Jewish male adult had to attend at least three feasts a year, the specific feasts. Feast of Pentecost, Feast of, of uh, Passover, and the Feast of Tabernacles. And so now, especially with Jesus um, having all this popularity and, and having done all these things and this popularity getting bigger and bigger, uh, this, this would even make this day even bigger in terms of population and, and the crowds. So we're told in verse 13, they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried. And the word cried is in a continuous form. So they continuously cried out repeatedly. Basically, you could say that. Repeatedly, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You know, Hosanna means save now, save now. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Then, when, then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it, as it is written. Verse 15, fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. So he had said, my hour is not yet come. This is the beginning of his hour. This is the beginning of, of all these things. He knew this would push the religious leaders over the edge, going out of their mind, which we see at the last verse of our text today. They're just going crazy with this, and he knows all that. But this was prophesied to the day. In 445 BC, uh, there, was, there was the fulfillment of what Daniel talked about in chapter 9, where the decree was made to rebuild the city and the wall and all of that to Nehemiah at 445 BC. And 173,880 days have transpired to this day, April 6th, AD 32, fulfilled that prophecy to the day. And we're going to get into a little bit of that regarding the other passages that, that were, you know, that are other gospels. So if you think about it, this is, this is, it can't, you know, we're told in other passages, he said, when the, the religious leader said, stop it, tell them to stop. They knew exactly what was happening. And he said, if they don't, the rocks will cry out. It's going to happen, the fulfillment of me coming, presenting himself. And I just, you just think, why, why didn't the whole, I mean, all of Israel receive him as the Messiah? That's what he wanted. He wept. We'll get into that. And, and he cried, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, oh, I have longed to gather your children as a mother hen gathers her chicks, but you were not willing. 
It's not that they couldn't believe, it's that they wouldn't believe. And, and, and all of Jerusalem, all of Israel needed to receive their Messiah. And, they, and they, they did not. So these passages he quotes, Psalm 118, that's part of the Hallel Psalms, that they would sing as they ascend Mount Zion during these feasts. They would sing these, these Hallel Psalms. And, they would, they, and, and it's great when you go to Israel, a lot of times on the bus, when you're going up and you're ascending Mount Zion, you're ascending the hill that goes up to Jerusalem, sometimes you sing these psalms. It's beautiful. It's also quoting Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. And what's interesting is that this is something that he instigates. Usually, he, he, you know, like he's, just, he's led by the Lord, of course, but he's going with what's presented to him. He's being led by the Father, all these things. But this is where he purposely does this. And he orchestrates it. Luke tells us in Luke chapter 19, verses 30 and 31, that Jesus said to two of his disciples, go into the village opposite you, where as as you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you loosing it? Thus you shall say to him, because the Lord has need of it. So he purposely orchestrates this. He sets this up. This has to happen. This is the fulfillment of prophecy. This is the official presentation of the Lamb of God, the King, the Messiah. This is what everything has been building, building up for, or, or you know, towards. This is what the prophets spoke about, this promised Messiah. And he's going to come and fulfill this prophecy of Daniel chapter 9. You can read it on your own. You can put it in the margin of your Bible to read it. Daniel chapter 9. He talks about these 69 weeks of years and all of that and... and and he, and he gives very specific things. And this is fulfilled to the day, the Sunday before he's crucified. So he's always telling people, you know, don't tell anybody. He's always deflecting. This is not deflecting at all. It's proper. It's, a, it's, it's appropriate. And he's going to ride from where he was near Bethany, and this, which, which is on the other side of the Mount of Olives. So the Mount of Olives is situated where on the, the east side of the Mount of Olives was Bethany and Bethage, this other city that they get this uh, colt from, this donkey. And they, he was going to ride over the peak of the Mount of Olives and then come down through the traditional, it's a tra- well, it's not traditional then, it was, hadn't happened yet, but it's for our traditional, when we go there, the, the, there's a road that you go down and it's the traditional uh, path and it's, we'll go pre- it goes way, 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 way back that road that goes down to the Kidron Valley and up to Jerusalem. So he's, he's doing that, and he's presenting himself as the Messiah, the King of Israel. But the problem is, is that there, it's been said that, that uh, he was so close to Jerusalem, but Jerusalem was so far from him. So he's descending. There's crowds there. There's crowds from all over the place. Um, and, and, Luke also tells us that as he went, that he wept over Jerusalem, as I mentioned. In, in Luke chapter 19, verses 41 through 44, we're told this. Now, as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it. And that's the word that communicates sobbing. He was sobbing. He wept over the city, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, and I'll keep reading, but it's your day. This is the day. This is the day that was prophesied. This was the day that if they were Bible students and they studied Daniel chapter 9 and understand Nehemiah and all of that, they would understand that this day was ordained before the foundation of the world, that he was going to come and present himself as their Messiah, and then that was going to continue to cause the chain of events that's going to lead to his death upon the cross. And he says, especially in this your day, the things that make, your, uh, that make for your peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an encampment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side. And that's what the Romans did. And level you and your children within you to the ground, and they will not leave you, leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not know, and look at this last phrase at the end of verse 44, you did not know the time of your visitation. You didn't recognize the time that was allotted to you by God to be visited by him and, and, and have this, 
presentation of him being the Messiah throughout his whole public ministry. What a privilege it is to have God come in human flesh and be able to, to visit his people and be able to die for their sins and be their promised Messiah. Now again, when they're saying save now, save now, they're primarily meaning deliverance from Rome. They're still looking for this political uh, civil Messiah that would take them, military leader, that would take them out of the bondage Rome. Even the, even the, the, you know, Jesus is dealing with the disciples on the Mount of, uh, on the Mount of Olives on the day of his ascension. You know, talking about, it's, it, you know, Lord, is this the time you're going to restore the kingdom of Israel? You know, and and um, so he's he's revealing to them. You have to have re- understand why I came in the first place. I didn't primarily came, come to be able to deliver you right now. That's not why I came. I came because of, you need forgiveness of your sins. The second time I come, that's when the real triumphant entry happens. That really should be the, called the triumphant entry, triumphal entry because, yes, it was prophesied that when he did this that we're looking at, but the second time when he comes, the second coming, which well, there's more prophecies about that than any of the first coming prophecies, and there are many of those, his second coming prophecy, when he touches down on the Mount of Olives and it splits, and then he walks down that same path and he goes to the eastern gate that's blocked up, that's blocked up right now. And I don't know if it'll be blocked up then. They are going to rebuild the temple before that happens. So I don't know if that's going to be cleared or not. But right now it's closed, the eastern gate. And the Muslims put all kinds of graves and all that in the way because they, they know that Jews can't step on anything unclean. And they've, they've done all these things like as if he can't just levitate and just kind of float over all those and then land before the gate and go in. Um, but... It, you know, he's going, that's his triumphant entry, truly. But here he's being presented, and here he weeps as he's going on this path. And he has the people that were there that saw um, the miracle of Lazarus, which we'll get into in a second. So 38 years later, the fulfillment of this would happen when the Romans in AD 70 come, and they completely destroy the city. They do surround the city. They're, uh, the Jews that are fighting are way outnumbered, and they st- course one of the classic things or basic things that you do in the military is you cut off supply lines so that's what they did <clears throat> and they they conquered that city and they didn't leave one stone upon another when you go there you can see these massive stones top toppled over that are left over from that time and 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 it's just evidence of course you know there's more there's so much evidence for all of this related to archaeology but so It's good to remember that this was so devastating to the Jews to have their temple destroyed. I don't, as Gentile believers, it's hard for us to even fathom how devastating this was to them to have this happen. And one time the disciples were were showing Jesus the temple. They were showing Jesus how how impressive it was, as if he didn't know how impressive the temple was. Uh, And he says, these stones, or that's basically, is that impressive to you? Not one of these stones will be left upon another. So yes, the Jews, God hasn't forgotten Israel. He still has a plan for Israel. Yes, they're going to receive the Antichrist. They're going to be deceived. They're going to accept this covenant that he's going to make with them for seven years. And in the middle of that covenant, he's going to break it. He's going to pre- present himself as God in, the, in the, the temple that they're already preparing for. They already have everything they need for the temple already prepared and ready. So when that covenant comes, they can just jump into action and they can put that uh, all the things in the temple and everything. So they've done that, and so they're ready and everything, so they've accepted that. And then when he comes at the end of the seven-year tribulation, then they're going re- to you know, look on, on him whom they have pierced, and, and, and they're going to grieve, but he's going to be gracious as he always is, and he's going to accept them. That's the real triumphant entry. Now notice the honesty of John in verse 16 related to their initial ignorance of all of this. Look with me at verse 16. Uh, his disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. I just love how honest the Bible is because the disciples, it's just honest. John writes, we didn't understand. I love that. I remember that in, in school where 
no one understands what the teacher is saying and you're so thankful for that kid that raises their hand and goes, I don't get it. <laughs> and you're like, oh, I'm so thankful that you, that guy asked that because I don't get it, but I want to look stupid. No one likes to look stupid. The disciples didn't want to look stupid, but they knew that they got to tell the truth. That's what I love about the scripture. It's honest. The Jews didn't make up the Old Testament. They wouldn't have made themselves look so bad. They would have made themselves look so good. They would have made themselves look better, how, how we would write it if we were, we were doing it. So I love that. But, it, but, it, but this, it, this learning and this growing was, was a, a process for them. You know, in John chapter 2, earlier, John said, talked about how Jesus said, destroy this temple in three days, I'll raise it up. And they're freaking out, the religious leaders. It took us 40, it's taken 46 years to build this so far up to this point. It wasn't even completed yet. And you're saying you're going to rebuild it in three days, and it says he was talking about his body. And then um, we're told there, uh, that in verse 22 of chapter 2, Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, the disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they believed the scriptures and the word which Jesus had said. So the disciples' understanding of things was progressive. And John's remembering back. He's, he's in his 90s right now. The average lifespan was 45, and, and he's an old man now. All the people are gone that are in this account. He's remembering back 50, 60 years to these events. He was a teenager when all these things had happened, just, just probably you know, 17, 18, somewhere in there. He was very, very young, but God had, had sustained him and, and, and blessed him with long life. Some people would argue that that would be a blessing sometimes with all the things that happen when you're old. Um, but uh, you know, God, God obviously knew it was a blessing. And so we're, we're told in verse 17, Therefore the people who were with him when he had called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead bore witness. So there's, there's people that, are, that heard all those things, that saw those things, that witnessed those things there on the other side of the Mount of Olives. And they're there, and they bear witness to what Jesus was doing, being on this donkey and, and riding in there uh, to, to Jerusalem. But then also there are a group that had met him uh, on the donkey that had heard of these things that hadn't seen it. So it's, it's, it's almost like people from Jerusalem came, people were going with Jesus as well, and then they kind of met in the middle there. And the whole, that whole street uh, or path or whatever down was lined with people throwing down palm branches. That was something that was expressed um, a nationality, I mean, a, a nationalism of, of Israel, even a couple centuries before this. And so they were laying down palm trees and it was connected to the Messiah coming, the king that would come. And so they're laying they're lying these things down. And we're told in verse 18, for this reason, the people also met him because they heard that he had done this sign. So again, they're coming, they're meeting him and everything. And then verse 19, this is the, the frustration verse uh, for them. Uh, they had a bad day. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, you see that you are accomplishing nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Very bad day for them. That nothing was going right. They wanted him to decrease in influence, but he was doing the opposite. He was increasing in influence. They knew exactly the, the scriptures he was fulfilling. And, and, and they were probably thinking he's trying to fulfill these things. He's, it's not really him. It's not really the Messiah, but he's, he's appearing this way. And they're wanting all these praises and celebrations and shouting and all those things, waving palm branches. They want all that to stop. They want it all to stop. And they're so mad. You ever had your plans completely thwarted by God? That's kind of frustrating, you know, at first. Because you're like, these, these, these things are good. These things are you know, appropriate. And all of a sudden, he's frustrating them. And that's what's happening to them. Their plans are being frustrated. And, and they're saying, you see that these plans are, they say, you see that you are accomplishing nothing. So they're saying to one another, they're more, ones that are probably more active. They're probably some that are, that are been tasked with doing certain things regarding this and the, the other ones are saying everything that you're doing you're it's accomplishing nothing he says they say look the world has gone after him a little bit of hyperbole there but to them that's what it meant to them the world is going after him 
And that directly meant that if the world's going after him or that many people are going after him, then that's that many people that are going away from us. And our influence and how we love to be respected. We love to sit in the seat of Moses as, as Jesus would scold them over. And, you know, all those things, the money that were connected to it, all of the position and the pride and the, the people just love, you know, they love to see, have people respect them and, and respect them in the marketplaces that use the titles, rabbi, rabbi. They, you know, they loved all of that. It lifted them up and gave them significance. And it was all threatened by what Jesus was doing because he was fulfilling prophecy and he was the Messiah. And I can't even imagine the kind of plans that came after this frustration and the, and the anger and, and the vitriol and the slander and all those things. They were just gnashing their teeth at, at this man who was just coming to save them, coming to be their spiritual, their spiritual Messiah. The, the, they were expecting this political Messiah, but he's coming. Your greatest need isn't political deliverance. Sorry to disappoint you. You know, in our culture today, especially in a lot of churches, they're so focused on politics. They're so focused on things that are temporal, that are passing away. And, and again, we need to be salt and light. We need to use our influence. But the greatest need that people have is not having... Um, everything go the way they want it to go in life and having all the things that, you know, the, the, this whole context here is under a Russian government. I mean, not Russian, way off. Uh, a Roman, I knew it was an R. I knew it was an R. Re uh, almost said it again, a Roman government. And that's the context into which Paul talks about being submitted to governing authorities, that the governing authorities in this world are an extension of God. And it was corrupt. It got, Christian, the success of Christians in terms of the gospel and the Great Commission and bearing fruit and being the body of Christ is not dependent upon any government. Think about the, our brothers and sisters in China. And they're under that oppression. There's more Christians there than here. The, 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 even, even when you get in the book of Acts and you see that they just wanted to stay in Jerusalem, they wanted to be there, they wanted to enjoy the temple, they, they were meeting in Solomon's porch all the time and, and communicating the gospel and sharing and teaching and going from house to house. They loved all of that, but they weren't going out and preaching the gospel. So God brought persecution and, it's, and it uses the word scattered like seed, like they were scattered it's a word that they would use to broadcast seed. You know, when you would, the first use of broadcast was farming. When you broadcast seed and you would throw seed, and it said that's what they did with the disciples. The disciples were spread like seed around because they weren't willing to. So some God, time God uses trials and tribulations, persecution, to get us out of our comfort area to think, start thinking about the lost, start thinking about preaching the gospel because he wants to use us in all those situations. And I just love the fact that he feels so free to just go, I'm going to do whatever I need to do to get you to be fruitful, to get you to be uh, bearing fruit and get you to be where you're, you're reproducing. God's called us to reproduce. And sometimes we're not willing to share. And honestly, and I'm talking to myself too, it's very, 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 very horrible to, to keep our mouths shut and not preach that gospel, especially today with how everything's getting worse and worse and worse and worse because we're getting closer and closer to the end. We need to be bold with our faith and all of that. So we just see this great, giant ex expression of God's love, fulfilling of prophecy. Your faith is, is founded on, on fact and history. And there is biblical basis for what happened in this account. And, and it's so great to be able to look at these things and go, we want to give... You, Lord, your praise that you're due. We want to acknowledge you as the Messiah. We want to celebrate you as the Messiah. We, we just see the sensitivity of his heart, just weeping and weeping. It, it, it should have been something that everyone received him, but it wasn't because he was focused. Again, it's like a mixed thing. He was, of course, blessed by the worship, and I'm so glad that that happened. But at the same time, what is he thinking? He's thinking about the ones that hadn't received, that hadn't recognized him yet, that were lost, and they're going to receive the consequences of that because of their rejection of him. And he's weeping over the reality that that's going to happen. 
So I just love his heart. I just love the fact that he is such a beautiful Messiah, such a beautiful king, and we can worship him. We can bless him with our lives. Just like Elena quoted, we love him because he first loved us. And it's such a privilege to be able to look at these things and, and, and be reminded of these things as we, as we worship him. So we'll stop there today, but let's, let's pray and ask the Lord's blessing, Lord, uh, related to what we've seen from, from him in, in the scriptures. Lord, we, we just thank you for fulfilling prophecy here. We thank you for Jesus being the Messiah and, and, and having him worshiped at that time. And we just know, Lord, your great heart is to save the lost. And so we pray that you would help us to be used by you in every situation, Lord, we find ourselves. Help us to be sensitive to the people around us where we're in public and be willing to talk to people and share and invite them or preach your gospel to them, but we just thankful. We're thankful, Lord, that um, you you are the King. You are our King. We're so thankful for you being the King that we get to love and worship, Lord. So we thank you for all this. We thank you for what you've done among us today. We thank you that you are the way, the truth, and the life. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. If you're here today and you've never given your life to the Lord. You need to do that. Please come up after the service. I'd love to answer your questions, to give you a Bible, whatever you need. Pray with you to receive Christ. And, and then you can be transformed by him and, and have him change you for, the, for his glory. God bless you this week. Beach day, 10 a.m. Francis, <laughs> be there. Y'all know this one. take off for your, um, to have a beautiful Sunday. Um, I just want to thank you for your prayers that you covered us in a few weeks ago for Matt and I. Man, God answers prayers. He answers them and he, he did more than we even asked for. 
and it was it was it was wonderful. And um, I just want to also say that if you ever need prayer, this we this church, everybody, we're just, you guys are just so beautiful, and you just we just love on each other. If you need love, prayer to be covered, whatever it is you need, ask and seek it. Prayer works, and he answers, and he's so good. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good Sunday.